It's draft day in Oklahoma City. What are the Oklahoma City Thunder going to do with pick number 12? Will they even be picking at pick 12? What's the best, worst, and most likely case scenario tonight? Find out on today's Locked On Thunder podcast. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member and editor-in-chief over at thunderousintentions.com, Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LOThunderPod. Email the show, LOThunderPod at gmail.com. On today's show, brought to you by Bird Dogs, we're going to dive into the best Worst and most likely case scenario for the 2023 NBA draft for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Plus, what would be the craziest outside the box thing that we can think of? And my NBA big board entering tonight's draft. A lot to get to today. It is draft day. Today's show is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked in NBA. And they're going to throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. It's draft day and the rumors are swirling, but you need to just enjoy the ride. We can sit here for the next 12 or so hours and wonder, are the Thunder going to trade up? Are they going to trade back? Are they going to stay at pick 12? What are they going to do? Will they have more than one first round pick? But in reality, you just get to sit back and enjoy the ride and see what happens tonight. Because whatever Sam Presti does, we're going to talk ourselves into it, number one. Number two, the Thunder can truly do anything. Like, There's a reason why even the most secretive organization is extra smoke screeny this year because you can talk yourself into them doing anything. They could trade back from pick 12. They could trade up from pick 12, or they could add an additional first-round pick because they have the cap space to take on a bad contract and net them an asset. They have the roster spots to handle getting additional picks in this year's draft, and they have the future assets to uh, maneuver the board with. And so when you hear all these names like Kobe Bufkin, Leonard Miller, Bly Kulabale, Derek Lively, Dries Walker, Taylor Hendricks, Grady Dick, we're going to get our answer tonight in a few hours at the NBA draft. But however you get there, you just have to enjoy the ride. And, and, and there's now smoke coming out that Globale is rising. Could be Bufkin. I might go in the top 10. But that means somebody has to fall. So as you start to paint this picture, as you go and, and run your mock drafts, as we wait for the NBA draft, there is no puzzle that you could put together where all of the talent is gone by pick 12. So even if they just stay put, you're going to get a very good player, or at least a shot at a very good player. The real winner here is the fan base, because this is going to be one of the final times that we can say the Thunder are playing with house money. You've been hearing that phrase for a long time. You've been hearing that phrase since before the pandemic. That phrase is quickly coming to an end in Oklahoma City. Very quickly, there will be expectations. Very quickly, there will be pressure on this team, on the players, on the front office, on on winning basketball games. That is coming quicker than you know. Very quickly, they can't afford or have the luxury of taking these massive swings, of having it all work out, of having their cake and eat it too. That's coming down the line quickly. But for tonight, for tonight, it truly is house money. Because Chet Holmgren, if they do nothing else this year, they're going to add Chet Holmgren to this team. A year removed from him being one of the most talented big men prospects we've seen. They have Jalen Williams, 
who had a phenomenal rookie season and looks like he should be, or he could be, the second best rookie in that draft. Usman Jang flashed, and he's working with Chip England this summer, and there's a lot of stuff around him. But you also have SGA, who's a superstar. You also have Josh Giddy. You also have a billion future first-round picks. So the real winner here is this is yet another event where there's where there's not this do-or-die pressure that is eventually going to come to Oklahoma City. So for the time being, you can truly just relax. You can truly just enjoy it. You can truly take it all in. Because there is no dire thing for the Thunder to do. They logically could trade back, could trade up, could stay put. They logically could get back into the first round as they did last year to get Usman Jang. So we just wait and see. We just wait and see. And part of that is finding the best, the worst, and the most likely case scenarios for the Oklahoma City Thunder in this draft. An exercise that we do before every major event, every trade deadline, season, uh, free agency, draft, everything, lottery, everything. We, we do this exercise of best, worst, and most likely case scenario. The worst case scenario for OKC, as they once again are playing with house money, is pretty simple. And it's pretty hard to come up with. I think that there are two names that realistically you could see maybe Sam Presti will go with at 12 that just wouldn't appease part of the fan base. We've talked about Ryan Rapier a lot. I, I don't see a role for him offensively. He's an elite defender, but I'd have a really tough time selling Rapier at pick 12. We've talked about him a lot. Derek Lively at pick 12. We've done a whole draft profile on him. Throwing him in the worst case scenario tab is, is really unfair to him. But the, the issue is, again, trying to find what would be considered the worst case scenario. Sometimes your worst case scenario is still a good outcome. And while I think that there's going to be better value on the board than Derek Lively, for sure, you might buy into the open gym shooting. You might buy into maybe he can become more aggressive at the next level and become a rebound gobbling big man. You have you would at that point have a lot of really good shot blockers at the rim. Poku is good. Chet's supposed to be you know just this great shot blocker. Lively's supposed to be this great shot blocker. And something that I think has been, you know, vastly undersold a bit in the lively conversation has been your head coach. Like we've seen Mark Dagnault be very, very, very creative. Through every iteration of the Thunder, Mark has been extremely forward thinking, but also extremely creative to explore the roster and find mismatches and find combinations that work. And so giving him a big man to throw on the floor with Chet and giving him the option of creativity, is not a bad thing. But the issue is, again, the value, the value of pick 12, the value of long term. I don't think that Lively and Holmgren together is, is your starting is in your starting lineup long term. So at pick 12, are you really you know, betting on tying up your bench unit in rotation? The value of I think it's going to be easy to, rep, you know, to to replicate what Derek Lively is via trade for a veteran center or signing a center. So, so the reason why Lively finds his way to one of the worst possible outcomes is because of just the pure value at pick number 12. But unlike Repair, he at least has a pathway to sell you on why he should be pick number 12. And there is smoke around him being the pick at 12. And he does have fans within the fan base at pick number 12. So that's the worst case scenario. And that's why we started the podcast with enjoy the ride. Because even the worst case scenario, even if at pick 12, Adam Silver comes out and he reads the name Derek Lively this second to Oklahoma City Thunder, it'll be a point of buzz and excitement. And like, you're going to race to YouTube. You're going to race to Synergy. You're going to race to Twitter. And you're going to look at all these highlights from his Duke days and envision pairing him next to Chet. 
I don't think this will happen. The Thunder have made it very clear that they think that Chet is a center. They've also, you know, went as far as to say stuff like, you know, we're not going to be predictive about what this core needs. And so you can't, you can't not be predictive if you're going to draft a center here at 12 um, whenever Chet's not played a single game yet. So piecing that together makes me believe that the Thunder aren't going to take Derek Lively. But, you know, they might, and that would, have, of course, result in everything we just said. So coming up, what is the most likely case scenario and the best case scenario on draft night for the Oklahoma City Thunder? We'll talk about it all coming up. But first, I want to say right now, our good friends over at Bird Dogs. Folks, go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA. Listen, Bird Dogs is the thunder of clothing because they sent us these incredible shorts and they fit incredible. They truly give you a sculpted look. And it's, it's, you know, the exact same thing as like Lululemon, only it fits way better. And, it, you know, it, it gives you a better fit than that stiff, restricted cotton feeling. And so bird dogs will fix your issues. But also when I say versatility, you can wear a pair of bird dogs to a business meeting in July and then head outside and go shoot some hoops because of the flexibility that they give you while also being presentable. So check out birddogs.com slash locked in MBA. And when you do, you're going to get a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA. Check them out today. You will not want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you that at birddogs.com slash locked on NBA. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. It's draft day. So listen to the Lockdown NBA Big Board Podcast. Listen to the Lockdown NBA Podcast as well for the national feed of all things NBA, including a trade that is just un, just, just popping up, unraveling and re-popping up with Porzingis and now Marcus Smart and everyone else. So uh, go, go find out how the dust settled on that trade on Lockdown NBA. And right now, let's talk the best case scenario for the Oklahoma City Thunder. To me, the best case scenario is you trade up for Jairus Walker. I love his aggression as a cutter. He's an elite roller. He's a spark in transition. He's defensively versatile. He's a grown man out there and just an awesome player all around with shooting upside. Like I, I believe in a shooting upside. And that's going to be, to me, there's two differences in Jairus Walker and Taylor Hendricks, like the, my one and two. And I think pretty much everyone's one and two for their best case scenario. For one, I think that Walker's a much better cutter. I think he's a much better cutter than Taylor Hendricks. I think Taylor Hendricks does more flashing through the paint than he does cutting. And I think that that gives him more upside as a rim finisher in the NBA. I think that Walker's ahead of Hendricks physically, you know, as a, as a body. And I believe in the shooting upside. Now, if you don't believe in Walker shooting upside then the edge goes to Hendricks. So that's really the swing to me. The swing of like one and two for Hendricks and Walker is do you buy into Walker's sh shot currently and then also after working with Chef England. So the, the, the margins aren't that wide. And I say that because oftentimes whenever you ask the question, you know, do you like Walker or Hendricks more? People will take the answer as like, oh, then you're just a, you're a Walker guy. No, I'm, 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 a, I'm a both guy. I've got a one A, one B. I would be thrilled if the Thunder walked away with either of them. And I think of the two, my number two best case scenario is Taylor Hendricks, and he's the most obtainable on draft night. Again, I don't love his cutting. And I wonder if this was a product, to be fair to Hendricks, a product of their offensive system and what they asked him to do, of him just flashing through the paint, one the ball in the mid post, or if that's a comfortability thing with him of where, of, of how he chooses to cut, but he mains mainly just flashes through and tries to, to work himself uh, to the rim. So I, I like the explosiveness out of, out of Walker a lot more than Hendricks. Obviously he's more of a ready-made shooter than, than Walker is. Hendricks is already a, a near 40% three point shooter. So with what he's already shown you, plus the infrastructure in OKC, you imagine he'll be a better shooter than Walker, especially in Oklahoma city. And he remains versatile on the defensive end, a floor spacing big. I, I love his fit with Chet. I love Walker's fit with Chet. I think if you get one of those two guys, you have you have put a bow on your core and and you've you've kind of stamped your guys. 
because the fit gets seamless. The fit gets, gets easier to see. And it would be a fun, fun decade in Oklahoma City if you get Walker or Hendricks. There's a reason why I traded up for Taylor Hendricks in the, uh, in the Lockdown NBA Ultimate Mark Draft that you can go listen to on the Lockdown NBA feed. I, I traded with, with Utah. Find out how I did it by listening to the mock draft. And so Hendricks would be awesome. The third best case scenario is Grady Dick. We always rush to do these draft day trades and, and grades and, 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 and kind of recaps. If Sam Presti, no matter how he did it, outside of trading a piece of the core four, so I don't care how many picks he gives up, I don't care what contract he takes back. If he didn't trade a piece of the core four, but he landed one of these three, Walker, Hendricks, or Grady Dick, it would be an A-plus draft. Don't care what else they did. Don't care what else happened. Because Grady Dick is the best shooter in this draft. He's a movement shooter. He's a catch-and-shoot shooter. He is a connective playmaker. He has better cutting and rim finishing ability than he gets credit for. And we've seen him thrive off ball as a defender, and he's a better defender than people give him credit for. And we've witnessed what even a, a grain of sand worth of shooting has done for the Thunder offense, has done for the best players on your team. Just this, the, the smallest amount of shooting has made your entire core have, have a whole new world experience on the basketball floor. So you want that. You want more guys who can shoot. And Grady Dick is more than a shooter, like the Bee Gees. Come on now. Grady Dick would be a phenomenal piece in Oklahoma City. So I say again, if the Thunder walk away with one of these three names, it is a A-plus perfect, incredible draft. If they walk away with Walker or Hendricks, you've then put a nice, big, pink bow on your core. And it's just, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's it's like it's like giving the hardworking sixteen year old a, a, a pink convertible, a red Cadillac, uh, just the the perfect car, a G wagon, if you will. I'm not good with cars, but but you can be good with cars uh, if you go to eBay Motors, which we're going to talk about later on. So that's the best case scenario to me. The Thunder would be over the moon to get any of these three guys in order of most obtainable. I think you flip it on its head. I think Grady Dick is the most obtainable. I think Taylor Hendricks is the second most obtainable. And then Walker is the third most obtainable. I think that Hendricks, you would need to trade to, you know, pick nine at least with Grady Dick. The earliest you need to move up is 10 and Grady Dick could be a guy that like falls. Like if this if this smoke is real, and Quilabale or Buffkin jump into the top ten, jump into the top of you know top of the top half of the of the lottery, then I could see a world where he's where, where Grady Dick is there at twelve. So that's why I put him as the most obtainable because there, there's a world where he's at twelve. I really 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 struggle, and, and I can't honestly even squint and find a path for Walker or Hendricks to be at twelve you can at least squint and find a way for Grady Dick to be there at 12. And so that's why uh, he comes in as the most obtainable. Now, what is the most likely case scenario for the Oklahoma City Thunder? To me, the, there's two, but I'll give you three names because we did three best case scenarios. Kobe Bufkin and Belay Kulabale are the most likely case scenarios. Leonard Miller, I'll throw in as well because he's my favorite prospect. He's athletic. He, he's awesome in transition. Uh, he, he's awesome on defense, one through five, a small ball five, power forward type, elite roller, elite cutter, playmaker for his size, all that good stuff. Uh, so Leonard Miller, you know, I think would be a home run, uh, but I think that people have cooled on Leonard Miller a bit. But you know, for me, I'm a big Leonard Miller stand. Now, Buffkin and Kulabale, if you read the mock drafts, these are the two most you know, common names that you're going to find at 12. Buffkin, despite his age, still offers playmaking, uh, you know, I should say high upside at his, at his age, uh, but he also offers playmaking, shooting, defense, finishing ability. He's like an all around player who I think would have the easiest pathway uh, of guys who are going to be available at 12. 
I think Buffkin has the perfect blend of upside, but also easiest pathway to NBA minutes as a, as a contributing NBA player right away. So I'd rank him number one as the most likely outcome. Number two would be Black Lubale. I love his cutting. I love his playmaking. I love his upside as a shooter, but also I really like his rim finishing. I really like his defensive versatility. And I think that one day with his length and his frame, he can be a top defender in the NBA. And so I think Koulibaly is worth it. Because I think that Koulibaly has a higher upside than Bufkin. And the drop-off of, of NBA contributions in year one might not be as steep as people think. I think that Koulibaly could contribute in year one to the Thunder and to other NBA teams. So I have, I have Bufkin at one, Koulibaly at two, Leonard Miller at three for most likely case scenario. The thing is, we still have my big board and we still have our new um, addition to best, worst, and most likely case scenario. We're going to call it trying to out Presti Presti. Who would be just the surprise, shocking, stunning names that realistically could maybe happen at pick 12? We'll talk about that coming up. But first, I want to tell you right now, again, if you want to get good at cars, as I strolled through that Sweet 16 analogy, head on over to eBay Motors. eBay Motors was great. eBay Motors is there for you because they understand that just like a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is the perfect fit. With vehicles, you need every part to fit just right. So the next time that you need a part and you need one that fits the first time around, just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know it'll fit perfectly or your money back guaranteed. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game. And you want confidence when you shop at eBay Motors with over 122 parts, million parts to choose from. You, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win whenever you have the right parts guaranteed. Check it out today. eBay Motors fit, uh, guaranteed fits only apply for U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. eBayMotors.com. Let's ride. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you, talking Thunder basketball. Your next listen, check out the Lockdown NBA podcast. And also, for you everydayers, tomorrow we're recapping the NBA draft, what the Thunder did or didn't do, what happened. Just in general, what Sam Presti say? Everything uh, on on Friday's show. And then we're going to continue on. Monday is going to be winners and losers and so on and so forth throughout the pod. Your pod every single day about the Oklahoma City Thunder. Subscribe for free across all podcasting platforms. Make sure you check out the uh, mock draft show that we did, which is awesome. Uh, it's a great collection of a lot of good hosts. And uh, Raphael Barlow grades all of our picks as well. Plus... We're going to have a live draft show. Now, I'll be at the Thunder facility, so I will not be on the draft show, but you should still go listen to it. Go watch it during the draft starting at uh, 6.30 Eastern. I'm sorry, 6.30 Central, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Locked in to be a YouTube channel. Watch along with the draft with Nick Engstead and every other host that is going to pop in. You never know. I might pop in from the Thunder practice facility. You want to see what's inside of there? Might pop in. Who knows? Uh, but we're going to have a fourth installment of this special game. Then my big board. So the fourth installment is for the draft only trying to out Presti Presti. What would be the, the Sam Presti wild card he could throw in? I don't think that there's going to be a wild card at pick 12. I don't think that he'd go outside the box. I'm not really even sure why he would go outside the box at 12, but these are three names that would be totally outside the box. But like, yeah, I guess you could see it. Three Whitehead, just a pure bucket getter, extremely high upside, incredible in the high school circuit, but got hurt and is still dealing with injury issues right now. Uh, so I, I could see him like, Oh, they took, they took Whitehead at 12. They must really believe in him. Uh, Brandon Podzinski, the Santa Clara connection is obviously funny, but he's also a really good player. Like he, he is a high level shooter. He's a good playmaker that, that, they, that they look for. And I think he's a really good defender. Like Podzinski would be awesome in OKC, but 12 is probably too rich. And then Gigi Jackson, you know, that, on this podcast, Raphael Barlow reported that the Thunder uh, were watching Gigi Jackson work out, and Chris Paul advocated for the Thunder to take Gigi Jackson. 
12 would be too rich, especially with what we're hearing in the pre-draft process and some weird, wacky, wild stories. Um, but if any organization can, can take on the quote unquote challenge of Gigi Jackson and they have the culture and they have the, the connection between the NBA and G league, it'd be Gigi Jackson. You, you can use Gigi as kind of like a red shirt year where he plays mainly with the blue gets better habits on the court, gets better habits off the court, frankly. Um, and, and just kind of learns to be a professional, uh, and kind of mold him into what you hope to see from him. But again, at 12, that's that's probably too too rich. But we're trying to out Presti the Presti. We're trying to become uh, the unpredictability of Sam Presti. So those are three names there. So there you have it. Our best, worst, and most likely case scenario in the draft. Who do you want? Comment that below on YouTube and on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Comment down below. Who is your prospect? Who is the player that you want the Thunder to draft? I want to hear it. So my big board. I'm going to go rapid fire one through 65, actually 66. No, if it's 65, I still have a ton of names. I go all the way through the hundreds because I'm an idiot. I'm a total idiot on this podcast uh, on my actual big board. So if you don't hear a player you like's name, just ask me about it. And if you want to hear some rationale, ask me about it as well, anywhere you can contact me uh, and I'll let you know why or or how I have players rated certain places. But just want to get this out there some of you have asked and some of you care about my big board. Here it is. Top three, Victor one, Scoot two, Brandon Miller three. At four, I have Eamon Thompson. That rounds out the top four for me. Victor is clear cut. Scoot is a franchise changing player. Uh, I love Brandon Miller's two way ability. And then Eamon Thompson is that kind of star upside who is an elite playmaker and just an awesome player all around. Then I have Cam Whitmore five. And, you know, he, he's one that's rumored to be falling in the draft, but the high school talent, uh, w- what he was able to do in a, in a hard situation in college. Um, I still have him five hearing stuff about the knee, like whatever, if that's real, if that's smoke, who knows, but five Cam Whitmore, uh, six Walker, Therese Walker, number seven, Grady Dick, number eight, Taylor Hendricks, number nine, Anthony Black, number 10, Azur Thompson. So then, after the top 10, Balai Kulabale, Leonard Miller, Kobe Bufkin, and then I have Kaysan Wallace at 14, Jordan Hawkins at 15, CeeDee Sissoko at 16, Nick Smith Jr. at 17, Chris Murray at 18, one of the best 3 and D prospects that we have in this draft, I think, who who has a ton of upside as a three-point shooter. Number 19, Drew Whitehead. Number 20, Brennan Podzinski, whose sources have confirmed to me that his range is somewhere in the 20s tonight, so we'll see if that's true or not, Uh, but people very close to him seem to think that. Um... Noah Clowney at 21, Jet Howard at 22, Keontae George at 23, Bryce Sensible, an elite score shot maker at 24. Does that translate to the next level though? As he made a lot of difficult shots, we'll see. Uh, he, he has kind of the, some of the boomer bust potential uh, to either make this big board look smart or stupid. I, I don't think that he'll really finish anywhere in the middle um, for, for his career. At number 25, Julian Huchifino, another name that is rising, but I just don't see it with him. Number 26, Derek Lively. Number 27, a late riser, Omax, is at 27 for me. Number 28, Gigi Jackson, seemingly having a terrible pre-draft process, uh, but hopefully he's able to kind of get it together in the league. Number 29, Maxwell Lewis. Number 30, James Nagy, who I think with G League time, he can be a high-level contributor at the NBA level. Kobe Brown, one of my personal favorite prospects in all of this draft, at 31. Um, Kobe Jones at 32. Jordan Walsh at 33. Sources say that he worked out with OKC pre-draft. I'm sorry, pre-trade and pre-draft, obviously, but pre-trade with Denver, and they like him a lot. And that he he has been throughout this whole process, combine workouts everywhere. Jordan Walsh is just dominating the NBA draft. I mean, just dominating the shooting drills. Shooting drills have been awesome for Jordan Walsh, even though he didn't shoot well uh, in college. Neither did Jay Will. And Jordan Walsh is kind of taking that baton as well, where he's shooting the ball really well in workouts. Um, the Thunder would need to get back up to you know the, the low 30s to get him they're not going to get him at 50 and in fact there's some buzz around him going in the first round uh, that that seems very legitimate to me so we'll see what happens there with him 34 probably my biggest surprise of this entire big board it's not actually kobe brown it's actually Quavion smith who is just getting bastard in the pre-draft process i i've seen him as low as like 50 in some drafts i really like the shot on Quavion smith especially in this range 
Uh, 35, uh, UCLA's Jamie is a first round riser. I've seen him even in the NBA TV draft um, go to the top 20. Hopefully for him, he rises, but I just, I, I don't buy him as a first round talent. Uh, 36, Rand Repair. 37, a rim running big, Trace Jackson Davis. 38, uh, Keontae Johnson. The medicals have checked out, it seems, and he is an absolute stud. So I cannot wait to follow his career. Isaiah Wong, 39. Tristan Verk. Virk Sivis, I believe is how you say his name, uh, at 40. Julian Strothard, love him. Uh, a really just all-around prospect. And, and, and honestly, he screams OKC. Uh, he, he, the Thunder typically in the second round actually don't go upside. They go like more veteran-minded second-round players. And, uh, and Strothard has that tag on him, I think, for this draft. Uh, Mike Miles, again, sources have said he's worked out with OKC. Impressive college numbers, bench score. You can go check out uh, the draft workout tracker on Thunder's intentions to see every player that we know of who has worked out for OKC. Uh, 43, Jalen Slauson, elite sharpshooter, elite sharpshooter who the Thunder worked out very early on in the process. Uh, Marcus Sasser at 44. 45, Andre Jackson. I have a money Bates at 46. At this point, why not? But the pre-draft um, process has been very interesting for him. But if he has talent, we might as well swing on him at, at least in my opinion. Um, 47, Ben Shepard, 48, Julian Phillips, 49, Seth Lundy, 50, Chris Livingston, seemingly going to go very high, much higher than that, but I like his, his profile a little bit as just a flyer in the second round, 51, Justin Powell, one of the, one of the more underrated shooters in this draft class, 52, uh, Amari Bailey, 53, uh, Jalen Wilson, 54, Ricky Council, 55, Grant Sherfield, 56, EJ Gaines. I love EJ Gaines. Uh, 57, Charles Bioko, 58, Adam Flagler, 59, Landers Noli, 60, Jalen Pickett, 61, Jordan Miller, 62, Kenrick Davis, 63, Serge Abari Rice, 64, and 65, Oscar Tishibwe, and Drew Timmy. So that's my 65-player big board. There's more names than that, and if you want reasoning, for uh, where these players are ranked, just let me know in the comment section or on Twitter. But for now, it's draft day. Cannot wait. Cannot wait. Cannot wait for draft to get here uh, in a couple of hours. And we'll be back tomorrow to recap the draft. So follow along on Twitter for live updates Updates at Ryland underscore styles. And until tomorrow, be good. Be good to one another.